the coronation, literally the crowning glory for a king or queen. When they are anointed and recognized by God as the rightful ruling monarch. A great ceremony in Westminster Abbey. But historically, there was far more to it than just the coronation itself. It's not enough just to show up here at Westminster Abbey and have an archbishop put a crown on your head. You've got to show people who's boss and convince them that you will rule in such a way to keep them happy and also keep them on side. So how do you do that? Well, 450 years ago, it meant a lot of pomp and pageantry and a healthy dose of military might. It was achieved with a massive coronation procession right through the heart of London. I'm Tracy Borman, Royal Historian and Joint Chief Curator of Historic Royal Palaces. I'm going to retrace the route of this spectacular event and I'm paying special attention to one extraordinary Tudor procession, the perilous arrival of Queen Elizabeth I. Four hundred and fifty years ago, the most important coronation event happened the day before the actual crowning, setting the seal on the monarch's relationship with the capital and their people. It was the coronation procession, a spectacular event full of meaning and messages for the reign to come. And key to that event was this place, the Tower of London. Since the 13th century, the mighty tower was the starting point for all coronation processions, including a remarkable Tudor parade. I'm going to look in detail at the procession that began right here on the wintry day of the 14th of January 1559. It was the start of a reign of a famous monarch, but she came to the throne as a young woman with a precarious claim and a very uncertain future. This was going to be make or break for Elizabeth I. Elizabeth's mother, Anne Boleyn, was Henry VIII's second wife, the woman he ended his first marriage for. After she married Henry, she had her own coronation all to herself, complete with procession from the tower. But the marriage failed. Anne was executed. And her daughter Elizabeth declared a bastard. The succession would fall first to her younger half-brother Edward and then her older half-sister Mary. But by 1559, they were both dead. Elizabeth's time had arrived. Elizabeth spent the night before the procession here at the tower in the old royal palace, which stood exactly where I'm walking now, long since demolished. The tower was a fortress, but it also had its own royal residence. Elizabeth's rooms were where this grass is now. Well, it was ironic that she should have to stay here because it's exactly where her mother, Anne Boleyn, had stayed before her coronation in 1533. And for that occasion, Henry VIII had embellished the royal apartments and also added the famous onion domes to the top of the White Tower. It had been a triumphant moment for Anne. But despite giving birth to Elizabeth, less than three years later, Anne Boleyn had returned to the tower. She was tried here for treason, imprisoned in the royal apartments, and then executed. And then Elizabeth herself had been kept prisoner here in the same apartment, so it was probably the last place on earth she wanted to be. But she knew she had to be here to stamp her authority and to start her reign in just the right way. To explore how the powerful symbolism of the tower was obvious to everyone here that day, 
I'm meeting my fellow curator, Alden Gregory. Well, I think this is deliberately chosen as the starting point for the coronation procession because it links the two poles, really, of the monarch's power. The tower is a symbol of the monarch's earthly power, their martial and judicial power. And, of course, it's from here that they process through the streets of London to the, the symbol of the other pole of their power, their divine and, and spiritual power at Westminster Abbey. So I think that the messaging that goes along with these processions is really clear to the people who are witnessing them. They've got all bases covered, the earthly, the spiritual. They're here to rule and they have a right to rule. And they rule from palaces and castles like this. So is that particularly the case for Elizabeth I? I mean, half her subjects see her as illegitimate. Is she trying to really emphasise the fact that she has every right to be here as Queen? I think so, yes. I mean, I think this is, this is a symbol of royal legitimacy and a symbol of royal power. It's a very masculine symbol in many ways. It is a symbol of, those martial, uh, of the martial power of the, of the monarch. So the White Tower is, is the great storehouse of the nation's arms and ordnance. In fact, it's largely a, a store of gunpowder during Elizabeth's reign. And of course, every monarch from Richard II before her had processed from the Tower of London. So she's really just filling the boots of her predecessors. Mm. It's all about continuity, isn't it, when it's it comes to the monarchy? It's all about continuity and legitimacy. And this is the oldest symbol really of, of royal power in the country. So this allows Elizabeth to, to project her legitimacy right the way back to, not only to William the Conqueror, but in fact to Julius Caesar, who, who mythically is the original builder of the Tower of London. If you want to be accepted as monarch, you have to be associated with the tower. Absolutely, you have to control the tower. And of course, having control of the tower also gives you control of London. I mean, if we go back to the coronation procession, part of the purpose of the coronation procession is to, is to reset the monarch's relationship with the city of London, a relationship that historically could be quite fractious. So having control of the, of the Tower of London, I think, also gives them a, a, at least a symbolic sense of control of, of London itself. And probably, therefore, of England. Indeed. The night before her coronation procession, Elizabeth slept in the tower. Her elder half-sister, Queen Mary, had died only two months previously, but the portents seemed right for a January coronation. Traditionally, a monarch would choose a saint's day or some other holy day for their coronation. Not so Elizabeth I. She consulted her astrologer, Dr John Dee, who chose the date of the coronation according to the movement of the stars and the planets. Nothing had been left to chance. Royal officers had been involved in the planning with the City of London at every stage. All the messaging, costuming, who went where, was meticulously plotted. January the 14th, 1559, dawned with a few flurries of snow. But despite the wintry date, the weather did prove fair. Maybe John Dee knew what he was doing. Outside the tower, the streets of London were filling with crowds. People had been preparing for this for weeks. Everyone knew that the new queen would be readying herself to leave the tower and show herself to her people. And so the procession set off, and you can imagine the anxiety. Was the new queen going to be up to this role? It was the first time that most of her subjects would have seen her, her first big public performance. And so the stakes were enormously high as Elizabeth set out through the gates of the tower and out into the busy, jostling streets of the City of London. An eyewitness recorded the scene. Upon Saturday, which was the 14th day of January, the most noble and Christian princess, our most dread sovereign lady, Elizabeth, by the grace of God, Queen of England, France and Ireland, Defender of the Faith, marched from the tower to pass through the city of London towards Westminster. 
London in 1559 was an extraordinary place. As well as the tower looming over the city from the east, there was the teeming thoroughfare across London Bridge. St Paul's Cathedral's great medieval spire still rose in the centre. The river was full of transport and trade and the tightly packed streets still mostly squeezed inside the confines of the old Roman walls. Elizabeth was going to pass right through all of this en route to Westminster, the site of the old royal palace and the abbey where she would be crowned the next day, if all went to plan. The procession started well. We know all the details thanks to some remarkable records of the event. We have some wonderful depictions of Elizabeth's big day. We see her here enthroned in all her coronation finery. But these are particularly interesting sketches because they show the coronation procession. And here at the top, lots of military might. So there are ranks and ranks of soldiers all carrying their weapons. And then more soldiers accompanying this magnificent procession. But then a beautifully detailed sketch. Now, what really stands out to me is Elizabeth is underneath a canopy and she's the only one in the whole long procession who is. So this is deliberate to draw all eyes to her. She's special, she is God's anointed. And she's already wearing a crown, that's quite interesting because she knows that her position is contested, that at least half of her subjects think she's got no right to be queen. She's a heretic, she's illegitimate, the daughter of Anne Boleyn, the scourge of Christendom, and yet here she is about to take the throne. So she needs to go to town and she certainly has. You see at the top there, these gentlemen, they've all taken off their caps in reverence to her. And I'm particularly interested in this gentleman here, right at the back of the illustration, following directly behind the queen. He is Robert Dudley. He has known Elizabeth for some time. They were both prisoners in the tower. And of course, he is gonna to rise to become the new queen's principal favorite. And it's rumored her lover. There's a really detailed written account of Elizabeth's coronation too by Richard Mulcaster, who worked at impressive speed and turned out what I have to say is a rather flattering account uh, of the whole day. He's clearly very impressed or, or pretends to be. And he describes in minute detail every single stage of Elizabeth's journey from the Tower of London to Westminster Abbey. And nothing went wrong at all, according to him. Everybody is delighted that she is the new Queen of England. And there's one particular tableau or, or part of the procession that he describes in great detail. And it's very clear from this that it's the absolute centerpiece of the whole procession. And I'm going to go to the site of it right now. Thanks for watching this video on the History Hit YouTube channel. You can subscribe right here to make sure you don't miss any of our great films that are coming out. Or if you are a true history fan, check out our special dedicated history channel, historyhit.tv. You're going to love it.